Hello, everybody, and welcome to the first session of the PWL International Seminar. Thank you for joining us, especially the ones who are also here uh, two weeks ago. As you know, this seminar is organized in the context of the activities of the F FCT funded project Mapping Philosophy as a Way of Life, an Ancient Model, a Contemporary Approach, which has just been uh, uh, launched this month and will have a duration of 18 months. So after a very interesting and improvised first meeting where we discussed this, uh, this project and also future prospects for PWL more broadly, we are now ready and very much looking forward to listen to the first talk of the seminar. And I am very glad and honored to introduce you to our speaker today, Matthew Sharp, who is one of the one of the core members of our team and also one of the colleagues who has been more actively involved in the whole PWL movement and uh, scholarship. So I'm, I'm sure most of you will, will know him and have read uh, his work. So Matthew Sharp is an associate professor of philosophy at Deakin University. He's the author of six books, including The Other Enlightenment, Race, Gender, and Self-Estrangement, which has just been published with Roman and Littlefield. Then with Michael Yu, uh, Philosophy as a Way of Life, History, Dimensions, Directions, published by Bloomsbury in 2021, and Camus, Philosophe, will return to our beginnings, published by Brill in 2016. Uh, Matthew is also co-translator with Federico Testa of Pierre Hadot's Selected Writings, Philosophy as Practice, published by Bloomsbury in 2020, and co-editor of the Brill series on Philosophy as a Way of Life, Texts and Studies. Over the years, he has edited 10 edited collections and journal editions, as well as being the author of numerous articles in leading, leading ranked journals and book chapters on philosophy, social, and critical theory. Since 2010, his focus has increasingly become classical receptions and philosophy as a way of life, with a focus on the work of Pierre and Ilse Trujado. And the title of his talk today, or tonight, is Considerations on Philosophy as a Way of Life as Historiography of Philosophy, Restricted and Expanded Programs. So we are really very much looking forward to it. So without further ado, Mathieu, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, everyone. I'm just about to share my screen. It should be sharing now. <clears throat> and I'll put the slideshow on. Okay. Thank you, Marta. And, and again, apologies for the confusion with the dates and the date lines some weeks ago. Um, yeah, it was just a, a matter of um, just to getting the, the, the Thursday or, or the particular day mixed up in the different nations. Um, so I was on my way to work when I began receiving urgent messages from Eli as to where exactly I was. And I was sort of on, on the metropolitan transit route to work um, at that point. So my profound apologies. It does sound like people were able to meet and have a discussion, which um, was beneficial. Um, Thank you so much for the invitation to, to speak. Um, so the, the title of my paper has been announced by, by Marta um, and the terms of the paper and the subtitle in particular will um, emerge shortly. Um, so I think Haddo's work on philosophy as a way of life, which is becoming called PWL or PWOL, in its anglicization pre presents a, a profoundly challenging, I think, re reception of ancient philosophy as we know, and for many, a profoundly attractive reconception of philosophy. In his programmatic piece on PWL, I'll adopt that usage, John Sellers stresses that Hutto's claims have implications not simply within metaphilosophy, however, they also reframe the longer history of Western philosophy, as of course people will know. Hutto repeatedly claimed that the ancient sense of philosophy as a bios never completely disappeared from later Western thought in different places pointing to figures such as Montaigne, Goethe or Nietzsche, who each in their own ways reactivated this ancient model of philosophizing. Other scholars working in Hutto's wake have highlighted other thinkers, notably 
in the Renaissance and early modern periods. So this essay contends, firstly, that Hutto's reconception of ancient philosophy as akin to what Wittgenstein called a specific form of life does have far-reaching historiographical implications which are yet to be fully explored. And I know Marta in particular has also spoken about this. If we grant Hutto's contention that philosophy, at least once in the past, was something people lived, as well as something one thought, something that involved self-consciously undertaken self-transformative practices, as well as writing and argumentation, and something that has been conducted in different forms of teaching than those we presently credit, then PWL inescapably pushes scholars towards new and challenging answers to long-standing questions facing historians of philosophy. In particular, three questions. <clears throat> Firstly, following Lovejoy, what uh, Lovejoy calls the concerning the basic unit of such a history. Should it be specific ideas, arguments, texts, systems, oeuvres, or indeed past philosophers, types of people, schools, movements, or epochs? What should be the basic unit of analysis? Secondly, whether the best approach to understanding past philosophers and their discourses should itself be philosophical, interested in rationally reconstructing and assessing the claims of old texts and ideas and philosophers as first order validity claims about ethics, physics, logic, etc. Or whether this approach, or the best approach, should rather be historical, primarily interested in recovering a sense of how old texts and authors' claims, treated as second order historical data, were shaped by and shaped their specific cultural and historical context. Thirdly, concerning the exact scope of the history of philosophy and whether it should only include philosophies or philosophical ideas written down in argumentative and textual genres recognisably similar to those we use today in the academy, notably treatises but also discourses and perhaps summers, or whether uh, it might not include philosophers and texts which would not pass muster or peer review today because they are written in different genres with possibly different audiences and intentions in mind than those of today's academic philosophical writing. So secondly, in order to examine PWL's implications for the history of philosophy with these three dimensions or questions in mind, I want to introduce uh, or propose a new distinction. The distinction is uh, in the subtitle of the paper concerning what I call, um, not without significant hesitation really, uh, restricted and expanded programs for PWL. I think the term program is particularly unhappy. Um, but anyway, the restricted program is that of Hutto himself. The hermeneutic uh, pro program of um, a restricted approach to PWL as historiography of philosophy is restricted. It argues that philosophy was sometimes, but has not always been, conducted as a way of life, including in universities today. By contrast, the expanded program PWL position is exemplified by um, intellectual historians, preeminently including uh, my friend and Australian um, scholar Ian Hunter, whom we I'm going to focus on as representative of this position. Ian um, is not a huge fan of, <laughs> of my reconstruction of his ideas, but we <laughs> discuss that. <coughs> it argues that all of Western philosophy can be understood as involving different inculcations of specific ways of life, all of Western philosophy, uh, including what Hunter calls theory, meaning the works of people like Derrida, Heidegger, Badiou, on all of whom Ian has written. As we will see, these two PWL programs both contest other predominant ways in which the history of philosophy is widely written and taught, certainly over the last uh, hundred years. But they yield differing answers to each of the three uh, historiographical questions, which for convenience we will call the unit of analysis question, the approach question, and the scope and genres question. <clears throat> 
So basically, part one of the paper is going to look at Hutto in the light of these three dimensions. Part two of the paper um, is going to look at Ian Hunter's uh, work. And then part three is going to be a critical reflection, in particular on the idea of the expanded program, about which I have um, hesitations being more um, aligned, I think, um, in my own um, uh, my own thinking um, with, with Hutto's work um, and feeling that this is uh, the more fruitful approach. All right, so part one, <clears throat> um, A, is called Hutto's methodological restriction concerning the unit of, unit of analysis and approach to PWL as historiography. Okay, so Hutto, people will know, didn't begin dogmatically with the idea that philosophy just was or should be uh, a way of life and then look at philosophical history with a view to finding this preformed notion. The idea of ancient philosophy as PWL emerged for him out of a set of wider hermeneutic questions surrounding how to read old books. Um, he was, of course, in the beginning, uh, a philologist. It's also worth underscoring in this light that Hutto's wider hermeneutic methodology would see him continue to work on other subjects, such as the philosophy of nature, the role of creative misunderstanding in the history of philosophy, and the force of founding metaphors like that of the veal of Isis in shaping philosophical inquiry. Hutto's famous conception of ancient philosophy as PWL emerged as one restricted result from a wider research program and orientation. In the interviews translated as the present alone in our happiness, is our happiness, Hutto tells us that concerning the genesis of the notion of philosophy as a choice of life, it should also be said that I began by reflecting on this problem of how to understand the apparent inconsistencies of certain philosophers. This is important, I believe. I did not begin with more or less edifying considerations about philosophy as therapy and so on. It was a strictly literary problem. For what reasons do ancient philosophers, sorry, ancient philosophical writings seem incoherent? Why is it so difficult to recognise their rational plane? So what exactly is Hutto's methodology then that brought him to the idea of PWL? Faced with these seeming inconsistencies and seemingly literary features of ancient philosophical texts, we can respond by holding our own metaphilosophical assumptions constant. We then have a problem of how to explain the rhetorical and literary framing of, say, Plato's dialogues, Lucretius's poems, Epictetus's discourses, etc. Positioning them as either reflections of the ancients' limited philosophical abilities or as somewhat regrettable add-ons and distractions from the main rational game. This is the strategy of a rational reconstruction approach to philosophical history, with which Hutto is in decisive disagreement. One here extracts the arguments from what the, um, the, the scholar takes to be the merely literary clothing. The alternative, which Hutto began to explore following his decisive encounter with the later Wittgenstein in the later 1950s, is to more charitably assume, um, or um, I guess opt for, presuppose the coherence and competence of the ancient authors. We therefore have to suspend the idea that our ways of doing and writing philosophy are the only or best ways of doing philosophy. So this approach involves supposing that when Cicero wrote, wrote dialogues or Cleanthes a hymn, they were aiming at doing different, if not necessarily wholly different things with words than modern philosophers aim to do. So Hutto writes in the decisive 1962 text uh, on language games and philosophy, to translate the title, Wittgenstein tells us that in the philosophical investigations, what was necessary was to break radically with the idea that language only functions in a single way. It's also necessary, I think, to break with the idea that philosophical language functions in a uniform way. Philosophy is always in a certain language game, that is, it is always situated within a certain attitude or form of life. It is impossible to give sense to the theses of philosophers without situating them within their language games. It would be necessary, he's writing this in the early 60s, in this light to consider as different language games those so profoundly diverse literary genres, 
whether the dialogue, protreptic, exhortation, hymn, prayer, the handbook, the exegetical commentary, the dogmatic treatise, and the meditation, and so on. So there are two later pieces which are especially important, I believe, in laying down Hutto's methodology, first developed in this vital early piece, or first glimpsed, I think, in this vital early piece. The two pieces are, firstly, um, Forms of Life and Forms of Discourse in Ancient Philosophy, which Michael Chase, of course, translated and included in the book Philosophy as a Way of Life, which is Hutto's inaugural 1983 lecture after taking the chair uh, in the history of Hellenistic and Roman thought at the Collège de France. The second text is the 1991 preface that Hutto wrote to the Dictionary of Ancient Philosophy, uh, Ancient Philosophers, edited by Richard Goulet in French. In both pieces, Hutto makes what looks like a contextualist claim, and is, I think, a contextualist claim about understanding ancient philosophical texts just as if he were an intellectual historian interested only in showing the preconditions in which certain texts emerged and were shaped by their contexts. In the later pieces, <clears throat> sorry, in the later piece, Hutto in fact delimits three nested contexts in which he argues we need to situate a philosophical text if we are going to adequately understand what it is saying. So this is in the preface to the, um, the Goulet Dictionary. He says, we must situate the writing in the context of the school in which and for which it was composed, the perspective of the students for whom it could have been addressed. Moreover, it's in the school, after all, that the writing was conserved, classed in a corpus and commented upon with the aid of traditional rules of interpretation. Next, one must consider the form, that this form and content could be determined by political concerns. So a political context, for example, one could draw the portrait of an ideal king in order to advise or criticise a sovereign. <coughs> Excuse me. And finally, the third context, um, one must never forget that theory is never totally separated from the spiritual practice, which is the most well known, that philosophical works aimed to form as well as to inform and that philosophical discourse is only a means intended to lead to a mode of life which is not different from philosophy itself. So at this point we can see the implications Hutto's work has for the third question surrounding, sorry, the first question surrounding the basic unit of analysis in any history of philosophy. Hutto contests all approaches for which ideas, arguments, texts or even entire dogmatic systems would be considered as self-standing and sufficient objects for an historian of philosophy. Each of these data for Hutto is preconditioned by and stands in complex relations to institutional, political and spiritual conditions shaping the particular philosophical language games the philosopher writing was playing. At precisely this point, many philosophers will interject that the approach that is thereby being proposed would be better classed as history or sociology of knowledge or of education rather than philosophy. Does not such a contextualising approach necessarily foreclose the basic sense in which philosophical texts raise trans-historical validity claims about questions and subjects, for example, for example, logic or metaphysics, which are in no way specific to any one historical context? Doesn't such an approach prevent us from taking old books seriously as more than historical artefacts, as against potential sources for our philosophical education and edification today? In fact, arguably the principal historiographical in interest of restricted program PWL lies in how it stands, I think, in oblique relation to this response. Restricted program PWL, so that's Hutto, um, although not the expanded program, challenges the long-standard opposition between contextualising a statement as a second-order historical claim and being interested in its first-order claims to truth about ethics, logics, physics, etc. Hutto maintains, I believe, that this is not a real opposition. For him, contextual explanation of the conditions of genesis 
of an historical philosophical text is the interpretive precondition for correctly understanding and assessing just what truth or validity claims are actually being made in the ancient texts in the first place. Far from a means of rel relativizing authorial intentionality, that is, contextualization for Hutto is the only way to feasibly recover the intentionality of ancient texts. So he's not a postmodernist who thinks that the intentionality um, is uh, in principle or desirably to be relativized. This is a perspective we note that Hutto shares with two 20th century schools of Platonic scholarship, namely the Straussians in America, whatever we think of their uh, claims, and those of the Tubingen school in Europe, on the latter of which Hutto in fact wrote favorably. Hutto agrees with these scholars that there is no point debating an ancient philosophical text's meaning, or even the meaning of some particular episode or argument within them, unless we understand why it is being adduced, by whom, to whom, and in what settings. As Hutto writes, it seems to me indeed that in order to understand the works of the philosophers of antiquity, we have to take account of all the concrete conditions in which they wrote, the constraints that weighed upon them, the framework of the school, the very nature of philosophia, literary genres, rhetorical rules, dogmatic imperatives, and traditional modes of reasoning. One cannot read an ancient philosopher the way one does a contemporary author. In fact, the works of antiquity are produced under entirely different conditions than those of their modern counterparts. So moving now from the uh, unit question, the question of the unit of analysis and the approach to that unit, to this, those surrounding the scope and genres of ancient philosophy, according to Hutto. If the ancient philosophers wrote so often in the dialogue form, for instance, Hutto stresses that this is because the classical world remained a preeminently oral culture, unlike our own. Moreover, as we famously read in Plato, dialogue was held by the philosophers to be the principal means of enabling students to actively come to deeply process new ideas through questioning and answering. Understanding this enables us, he argues, to understand why ancient texts can seem so digressive and even at times self-contradictory. Quote, this relationship between written and spoken word explains certain aspects of ancient works. Quite often the work proceeds by the associations of ideas without systematic rigor. The work retains the starts and stops, hesitations and repetitions of spoken discourse or else after rereading what he has written, the author introduces a somewhat forced systematization by adding transitions, introductions, or conclusions to different parts of the work. So the dialogical provenance of the ancient texts also brings with it further decisive hermeneutic considerations. Because we speak differently to different people, and in a, any reasonably skilled dialectician or teacher, indeed any skilled parent, will shape their discourse to their audience. Socrates does not address Thrasymachus in the way that he, uh, as he does a well-meaning but limited friend like Crito. Conversations can also have different goals beyond the simple communication of information from one person to another, like pouring liquid from one vessel to another, as Socrates jokes near the start of the symposium. Just so, Hutto claims the different ancient philosophical works are shaped by the pedagogical settings from whence they came. Quote, some of these works are directly related to the activity of teaching. They may be either the summary the teacher drafted in preparing his course or notes taken by students, or else they may be texts written with care but intended to be read during the course by the professor or a student. Even texts that were written in and for themselves are closely linked to the activity of teaching and their literary genre reflects the methods of the schools. One of the exercises esteemed in the schools consists of discussing either dialectically or rhetorically what were called theses, that is theoretical positions presented in the form of questions. Is death an evil? Is the wise man ever angry? The largest portion of ancient philosophical works, for example, those of Cicero, Plutarch, Seneca and Plotinus, correspond to this teaching exercise. 
So almost all ancient philosophical writings, finally, are unlike modern philosophical writings in not being addressed in principle to everyone, Hutto stresses. Rather, they're intended, first of all, for the group formed by the members of the school. Some texts target beginners, others more advanced pupils. The exceptions are works of protreptic aiming at exhorting outsiders to become students. Recognising the way texts are shaped for specific audiences affects how unqualifiedly we ought to take any one statement within any single philosophical text. For instance, when that claim comes out of the mouth of a dialogic character like Plato's Socrates, as definitively representative of the author's own final views. So part 1b is now on the substantive historical restriction concerning the scope and genres of ancient philosophical writing as understood by Hutto. So we now have enough um, of Hutto's methodological approach to understand what we can call a substantive or historical restriction in his, un in his historiographical program, as I'm calling it, for uh, PWL. To read ancient texts without a framing awareness of their literary and so on considerations for Hutto is like listening in on a conversation between people with very different backgrounds from our own in a context which is unfamiliar to us about subjects which may differ from those we know well and expecting to fully understand that conversation. It is, however, precisely because the cultural, institutional and metaphilosophical settings have changed between <clears throat> antiquity and later modernity that we face this problem. And this recognition points to the restriction of Hutto's understanding of the place of PWL in wider philosophical history. So basically the claim here is going to be, of course, that philosophy as a way of life for Hutto effectively um, goes into some kind of a, a decline, uh, as people will know. I'll just summarise this so we can get to the, the Hunter part. Um, I'm, I'm thinking of Hutto's claims concerning the, the place of Christianity um, in supplanting, obviously, pagan culture more widely, but also in the context of philosophy specifically, the monastic schools taking on and Christianising the spiritual exercises while um, a, a restricted corpus of classical philosophical texts then become taken up in the context of the schools and universities, <coughs> such that in Hutto's claim in um, high scholasticism, philosophy as a way of life is effectively eclipsed, um, a claim which by way of Julius Domanski's work, he, he, he then comes to qualify at, at a certain point. <coughs> so in other words, the restricted scope, and this is why it's the restricted program, is basically going to distinguish between forms of philosophy that um, self-consciously in the author's intentionality aim at the transformation of students and the inculcation of forms of life or ways of life and those which do not. And for Hutto, the story of the evolution of modern philosophy out of medieval scholasticism um, is largely, with exceptions uh, noted previously, Montaigne, uh, even Descartes, um, passages in Kant, interestingly, um, but also uh, a figure like Nietzsche. Uh, apart from these figures, as we know, Hardo thinks that modern philosophy um, is um, university philosophy whose principal task, as he says, um, is no longer to train people as human beings, but to train them for careers as clerks or professors. That is to say, specialists, theoreticians, and retainers of specific items of more or less esoteric knowledge. Such knowledge, however, Hutto claims, no longer involves the whole of life. So I think this is a principal strength um, of this restricted program um, of PWL, and I'm open to advice on whether program is the right term, <clears throat> because it makes a contrast between a plurality of different metaphilosophical conceptions. PWL versus other non-PWL metaphilosophies as we look at the history of Western philosophy. John Sellers is invoking this conception of PWL when he itemises three distinct and overlapping claims about the history of philosophy in what is philosophy's way of life. So this is Sellers. The claim that PWL is a distinct tradition within Western philosophy, 
different in form and motivation from both analytic and continental philosophy, dominant in antiquity and present ever since, albeit marginalised in recent times, is characteristic of um, PWL as Sellers is presenting it, I think in a broadly Hadoshian uh, manner. And I think John's here and he can again um, refute me. The claim that PWL is a humanistic approach to philosophy to be contrasted with a scientific approach and as such perhaps sharing more in common with the work of some continental philosophers than it does with most analytic philosophy. And third, the claim that PWL is one pole inherent to all philosophy, sometimes marginalised but always present to a larger or a greater or lesser extent. I think that some of the most interesting work within um, PWL follows from claims one and two. <clears throat> Hutto's reconception of ancient philosophy to explain expands our sense of which philosophers and texts should count as philosophical and in our history of philosophy. Philosophy, as he asks us to see it, has included writing in many different genres with a plurality of existential and intellectual aims, including consolation, biogra biography, meditations, therapeutic writings and manuals for living well. Exemplars of each of these genres, if critically understood in relation to their wider contexts, can be seen now through Hado, after Hado, as means chosen by philosophers to form students in different philosophical ways, as against being not philosophical. For these reasons, Hutto's restricted program approach casts into renewed relief exactly those periods of philosophy which are today, or have, uh, I believe, recently been lesser studied, but which remain central to understandings of philosophy up to the period of Brooker, if we follow Christopher Colenza or perhaps Immanuel Kant. So the, the periods that emerge as particularly of interest to PWL are Hellenistic and Roman philosophy, sidelined um, in many um, programs. The philosophy of the Renaissance, again, sidelined in many programs. Even the literary philosophical writings of the Enlightenment philosophs. Um, and I thank Martha for, for mentioning um, my new book, which is, um, it looks uh, in the light of PWL at Voltaire, Diderot and Montesquieu. Whether we take Heidegger's history of the forgetting of being or more standard curricula in the history of philosophy today, these are the periods um, of what are usually understood, as Sellers points out, as classical humanism and its legacy, which are, have tended to be skipped over as lacking importance or not being philosophical in many programs around the world um, where Western philosophy is taught. For PWL also gives us a set of analytic tools now to approach these pre and early modern philosophical writings which put us on our guard against anachronistic assumptions about what earlier philosophers must have been trying to do. Here is elsewhere the post Wittgensteinian work of contextualization <clears throat> aims to open up philosophical claims about nature, ethics and logic, as well as metaphilosophical positions to critical assessment in terms of the author's own intentions, as against our expectations of what we think they should have been doing. So that's the section on, on Hado um, and giving some sense of my favourable orientation towards him. Not that I'm wholly unfavourable towards this next paradigm, um, which is that of Ian Hunter. I'm aware of the time and I, f I, s I feel like I'm going slower than I wanted to go, although I don't feel like I'm reading slower than I wanted to read. So perhaps if I just present H Hunter's work, then we can discuss what people think of the expanded program versus the restricted program and I'll finish hopefully by about 50 past or 55 past. All right. <clears throat> by contrast to Hutto's work, what defines any expanded program PWL position on the history of philosophy is an expanded claim at the level of scope and genre. That is the third question, the third dimension. <clears throat> the claim supposes, that is, that all forms of philosophical activity from the pre-Socratics to Peirce, from Socrates to Sandel, are meaningfully exemplifications of PWL, or in Ian Hunter's opening phrase in his groundbreaking study of Immanuel Kant, ways of working on the self. What motivates the expanded program's putative expansion of the kinds of texts and practices that would count as PWL? Well, to philosophize on any understanding of the verb is to undertake one type of activity as against others. So any person who makes philosophizing on any recognized model a large component of their lives 
in this sense just is living a certain kind of philosophical life as against the, the life or profession of a lawyer, doctor, trader, etc. We can accordingly, according to Hunter, use a post-Sadocian approach, or in his case, an approach which draws from Hutto, but also the Cambridge School. We become able to examine the different intellectual and other activities that the lives of philosophers at different times have involved and what Hunter terms their different philosophical or intellectual personae. This is a central character and uh, character and category, in fact, for Ian Hunter, this idea of intellectual persona. By philosophizing, one takes on a certain persona, a Derridian, for example. What emerges from this expanded understanding of PWL is a new historiography of philosophy, but one that in contrast to the restricted program no longer identifies periods like that of the medieval or later modern periods in which PWL could have disappeared. The general concept of PWL just means that no such periods exist. Since the extension of what we are going to now understand as PWL becomes identical with philosophy at any given time. Instead, the expanded program sets us the task of identifying the different species of philosophical lives and personae over time say, the way of life of the ancient Greek philosopher, the medieval arts professor, the 17th century university metaphysician, the post-structuralist theorist, and so on. To even state these basic ideas raises several questions, <clears throat> which we'll consider now by looking principally at what I think is Hunter's um, most extended methodological reflection, uh, a 2007 paper entitled The History of Philosophy and the Persona of the Philosopher. So A, Ian Hunter and the personae of different philosophers. So this is unit of analysis and approach to historiography of philosophy. Hunter's history of philosophy and the persona of the philosopher begins by raising the approach question of whether in addition to being an object of intellectual history, philosophy is special. It must constitute its own method. Underlying this question, Hutto notes, is a prior dispute. This concerns whether there is something about philosophy, namely its role as a privileged expression of human reason, which would mean that studying prior philosophies as contextualised historical data, as against trans-contextual truth claims, would necessarily mean losing their specifically philosophical dimensions. Hunter sets out to critique a lineage of writing the history of philosophy which dates back to Kant. In the closing section of Critique of Pure Reason, and elsewhere, Kant calls for a philosophical history of philosophy, which is tied to his own transcendental philosophy. Such philosophical history is opposed, Kant argues, to empirical history of learning approaches on the ground that empirical histories of philosophy establish facts of reason, whereas a philosophical history of philosophy draws its data from the nature of human reason itself in the form of a philosophical archaeology. It's fair to say that Hunter is fairly sceptical of this approach. Given the transcendental role of the unity of apperception and its categories in constituting the world of human experience, prior philosophies as products of reason's attempt to understand the world can never be conceptualised properly as empirical data, Kant claims. The history of philosophy in the strict sense is the history of the transcendental subject's progressive efforts at self-illumination, culminating in Kant's own philosophy. It is a history of pure reason. For Hunter, the Kantian Copernican turn in philosophical historiography has remained determinative up to thinkers like Rorty, Taylor, McIntyre, as well as Derrida and the early Foucault. Quote, post-structuralism inherits a practice of philosophical history flowing from Kant via Hegel into Husserl and thence to Derrida. Broadly speaking, this is a line of development that sees Kant's transcendental forms of subjectivity being pluralised and historicised by Hegel, turned into claustral structures of consciousness by Husserl, with these structures then being rendered linguistic in a whole array of structuralist and post-structuralist concepts, discourse, episteme, difference and others. In treating these concepts as quasi-transcendental conditions of possible experience, post-structuralism continues to treat philosophy in a post-Kantian way, Hunter claims. 
as reason's mode of reflecting on itself and is hence constitutively opposed to treating philosophy as an object of empirical history. So we see already at the level of the approach question that whereas Hutto never, I believe, cedes the category of philosophy to describe his own work definitively, Hunter mobilises an expanded program PWL approach in service of a, a stridently empirico-historical approach to philosophical history. His is proudly a work of intellectual history, not philosophy. And although he's critical of a residual structuralism he sees in the Cambridge School, it is this school, more prominently than Hutto, which shapes, I think, Hunter's specific conception of PWL as a way of looking at philosophical history. Hunter's position, moreover, proceeds by way of an avowed polemic, as we can see, against post-Kantian philosophical accounts of the history of philosophy. Hunter takes inspiration in this polymos, this struggle against post-Kantian histories of philosophy from the politico-juridical civil philosophy of Christian Tomasius and Samuel Pufendorf in the early Enlightenment period on which he's written an excellent book. Hunter aligns the Cambridge School's work with these earlier thinkers' works, and he shares their concern with the epistemic pretensions and ethico-political implications of what Hunter calls university metaphysics, a way of doing philosophy of which Kant is the preeminent uh, proponent. As we've mentioned, at the level of the basic unit of analysis for the historian of philosophy, the key category Hunter adduces in his attempt to displace the Kantian understanding of philosophical history is that of the persona of the philosopher. This concept of the persona, he tells us, is a means of organising empirical historical accounts of past philosophies treating them as activities undertaken using definitive, sorry, definite intellectual instruments in specifiable historical settings. Quote, the persona of the philosopher is understood as a specific kind of self cultivated by select members of the European intellectual elite as the means of bearing philosophical knowledge. It is intended as a grounding for technical arts of reasoning alternative to what provided, to that provided by such concepts as paradigm, problematic, Weltanschauung and discourse. The concept of philosophical persona offers to account for the momentum and unity of the ensemble of logico-rhetorical methods, cognitive techniques and ethical exercises in forming a particular philosophy. It does so by approaching them in terms of their anchorage in a higher self made available in a finite series of privileged philosophical institutions and forms of pedagogy. So take Ian Hunter's example of the 1617 Opus Metaphysicum by uh, German thinker Christoph Schiebler. A post-Kantian or post-structuralist understanding might try to situate this text within and as one expression of a given conceptual paradigm or ep episteme which would allegedly undergird wider German or European thought at that moment. Hunter's approach also reads the text as historically situated and determined, but Hunter sees it as a more or less open bricolage, quote, a large and rather loose ensemble of doctrines, modes of proof, logico-rhetorical techniques and cognitive exercises, rather than the necessary unitary expression of any prior transcendental structure or structures, whether individual or collective historical. From Aristotelian and Christian sources, Schiebla takes the doctrine of God as a spiritual being. As for cognitive exercises, the text's logico-rhetorical technique involves what Hunter, directly echoing Hado, calls a particular kind of cognitive or spiritual exercise that Schiebla calls metaphysical abstraction. The ascent of the intellect from its preoccupation with material things by way of abstraction to the contemplation of higher immaterial things is above all for Hunter a change in the person of the inquirer, a transformation of the metaphysician himself, so that he can embody a particular higher self capable of pure intellection. Quote, the metaphysician thus does not come from his central objects, the spiritual substance 
their mode of occupying corporeal substances as the mouthpiece for a quasi-transcendental structure of conditions of possibility. It doesn't come to know these objects as the mouthpiece for such a structure or condition of possibility. He does so rather through the painstaking memorization of a whole array of doctrines, the practiced mastery of specific modes of proof and logico-rhetorical techniques, and most importantly, a powerful intellectual exercise understood as shaping the psychocognitive disposition required to accede to the knowledge of metaphysical entities. <coughs> For Hunter, we see the business of thinking and of writing as a philosopher is never a disembodied, de decontextualized, and in any way transcendental activity. Different ways of conceiving philosophy involve different arts of thinking, as he calls them. And these arts of thinking, far from being driven by some platonic eros or truth for truth or wisdom, let alone answering to any super historical human or natural condition, involve the, the pursuit, quote, of an open-ended array of intellectual performances for particular contextual purposes. They are instruments for the most diverse array of human activities, of economic calculation, to be sure, but also of erotic intensification, juridical regulation, spiritual contemplation, scientific experimentation, political rationalization, aesthetic cultivation, and so on. So I'll just read this um, last section um, of the second part called highlighting the expanded scope, um, which is the third dimension um, on the persona of the theorist. And that should get us to um, 55 past. All right, so I hope you're getting a picture of the kind of work that Hunter wants to do to challenge post-Kantian intellectual, uh, sorry, philosophical history of philosophy. We can illustrate the expanded scope of this post adocian approach to philosophy in Hunter's striking works on what he calls the history of theory. In these works, Hunter approaches the forms of post-Heideggerian philosophy, which are hegemonic in what is called post-structuralism or sometimes French theory, ironically, in the Anglophone world. One criticism that can be levelled at this theory, for instance, Derridian deconstruction, is that directed to highly refined audience, audiences, it is severed from all practical contexts and concerns. For, for Hunter, such a view misses that the primary products of courses in theory and of texts by leading authors in theory are above all new students of theories, transformed by a certain inner discipline into bearers of distinct personae, the personae of different kinds of theorists. The persona of the theorist is distinguished from earlier philosophical personae, including that of analytic philosophers, insofar as he, usually a he, has been shaped by a distinct philosophical paideia. Hunter traces the intellectual origins of this paideia to the Husserlian epoche. In line with the ancient sceptical signification of the term, this exercise involves what Hunter in Hedotian terms calls an act of inner ethical labour or ascesis, oriented to a type of self-transformation, quote, the apprentice phenomenologist or theorist is thus not someone whose task is to control their anger or restrain their lust, as in the Stoics or Epicureans, but someone who must forbid themselves from continuing what Husserl calls the whole natural performance of his life world. Through the ensuing exercise of reduction, the phenomenologist putatively gains access to a new object domain, that of what Husserl calls categorical intuition and transcendental experience. This involves a direct intuition, as it were at two removes from ordinary experience, of the transcendental conditions which in turn would make such experience possible. As Hunter reflects, in Kantian terms, Husserl's notion of transcendental experience or the transcendental phenomenon would indeed be monstrous. After all, the whole point of Kantian phenomena is that they never reveal the transcendent objects that may underlie them. For Hunter, however, the exercise of claiming access to what Derrida in his famous preface to the origins of geometry calls an archai region, an anarchy of the noema, which is at the root and possibility of objectivity and of meaning, lies at the formative heart of all subsequent modulations of post-structural theory. What defines the theorist for Hunter, that is to say, is that he is a figure who has been trained in the operation of suspending first-order empirical non-transcendental truth claims, including the claims of particular scientific and social scientific disciplines, as Husserl had asked his readers to purposely suspend their natural attitude. As Hunter writes, this theoretical moment 
was characterised by the surfacing of a certain intellectual conduct, minimally the abstention from empiricist or positivist knowledges through insight into their sleeping structures. In this perspective, we can see the post-structuralist theorist represents not a living break with the philosophical tradition, even when he proclaims his project to deconstruct it. He is a new persona in the history of philosophy and a new secularised avatar of what Hunter calls university metaphysics, quote, characterised by the desire to interrupt ordinary life and knowledge in order to rise above it, to look down on it, to be someone for whom and to whom the world declares itself in all of its purity. It is just that whereas Schlieber and differently Kant, each aimed at the creation of a persona defined by the capacity to ascend to pure intellection, or to purify reason through self-critique, the theorist critically subordinates all the regions of knowledge to the contemplation of a single eruptive source of meaning and structure, uh, whether this source would, is difference, difference, the different, power, being, event, will to power, or desire. Okay, so that's the substantive part of my paper. The remaining part, which is too long to read, uh, is going to reflect on the difference between the two programs and raise questions about um, the implications of what Ian uh, Hunter has, I think, um, presented as an expansion of PWL via an engagement with the Cambridge School into this um, way of looking at all forms of uh, philosophy. But <coughs> If you follow me, I hope you will have questions. So I'm going to stop there, Marta. <coughs> okay, Matthew. No, it was perfect. Many, many thanks for this very illuminating and uh, thought-provoking uh, paper. I hope you can develop uh, this last part of your paper perhaps now in the discussion. We do have uh, more or less 30 minutes uh, for questions. So if somebody wants to make a question or a commentary, please raise your hand virtually. Yes, Eli, please. <coughs> Maybe you can stop sharing your slide. Yeah, sure. Um, how do I do that? Okay, I can see it, yeah. Hey, Matt, uh, thank you for a, a really fantastic paper. This my, my question probably comes up into what I imagine is in your third section. So maybe it's just an excuse to hear your thoughts on this. But I wonder if, and I don't know Ian Hunter's worked well enough to see to think if there are ways to do that even within his own thought. But if there's a way to take some insight from the expanded program into the restricted program, if you will. And what I mean, for example, is there's a whole wealth I know in at least some a kind of broader uh, history of uh, higher education institutions projects that is looking at kind of scholasticism, for example, as a particular historic model that tends to appear in different kinds of very formalized higher education institutions. So it doesn't necessarily take the, you know, how do you say, the more structural, broad approach he wants to make, maybe uh, about the kind of universal habits of certain kinds of university metaphysics, but it says, no, we could actually tell particular historical stories about why certain kinds of uh, formal, highly theoretical positions uh, appear in different cultural contexts. Uh, so I'm not sure if you understand what I'm thinking, but basically I'm wondering if there's a way to, to keep that historical carefulness of the emergence and dominance of a certain way of doing philosophy and its decline and then look at particular histories of kind of whatever you want to call it, a, a scholastic tendency as a way to compare it without maybe taking quite as an a bold measure as what Hunter seems to want to do. Okay, am I unmuted? I think I am. Thanks, Eli. Yeah. Um, look, I'm not wholly, uh, as it were, hostile to everything that Ian has done by by a long shot. I think his work on 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 theory, for example, is is provocative um, and um, gets us to think about you know what we've been doing. Perhaps those of us who've 
uh, who were raised in certainly in that milieu for, for many years in the 1990s uh, and kind of what happened to us as, as people in in sense of we were, we were we were learning certain ways of thinking reasoning, reasoning styles of reasoning styles of thinking styles of writing and so on yeah, but also in such a way that paradoxically that very process was also invisible because the way we understood what we were doing was of course um, um, quite different. Um, so I, I want to stress that I'm not wholly hostile to what Ian's doing, and I think he's he's developing um, one one possible uh, implication of of Hutto's method um, hermeneutic approach, which is of course to contextualise, as, as I commented, and to look at philosophical practices and statements within contexts, including school contexts and institutional contexts, interested in the creation of certain kinds of human beings. Um, I have hesitations about Hunter's approach, um, preeminently because I think that he has to take on a position um, which, despite his hostility to metaphysics, uh, becomes a kind of meta position which claims higher insight into what other philosophers are doing, which they don't necessarily claim themselves. Um, so that is to say, he looks at um, philosophers through the lens of his PWL me methodology as a way of contextualizing them independently of what they think they're doing, whether I think Hutto contextualizes in order to find out what they're doing. Um, now, maybe that's not a problem. And um, in certain schools of intellectual history, that's just considered what you do. Um, but I guess I'm enough of a philosopher in my training to, um, to, to be cautious about that. I also uh, wonder about the relativism of Ian's approach, um, which I think does lead us to simply bracket first order validity claims entirely and to sort of come up with a kind of taxonomy of different intellectual personae across the history of ideas, mm -hmm. um, which again, given Ian's hostility to some post-Kantian approaches, which periodize and place people within periods as expressions of structures, I think, you know, that it, it, it can look relatively similar, um, the way the historicization is undertaken and the hostility to um, historicizing periodization through transcendental episteme or something like that, notwithstanding. Um, so, you know, I, I think, I think both you can use Ian's work to think about philosophy and philosophers of different periods, but by this expansion, the third thing that I'm worried about is of course that you do lose that distinction between, I think the Stoics are doing philosophy in a, in a very meaningfully different way than than post-structuralists. And I think although we were formed, uh, those of us who were raised in the 1990s literary theory departments were, were, were definitely formed to read certain texts and speak in certain ways and do certain activities, they weren't really helping us with managing our passions. They weren't really having, <laughs> helping us with being better people. Um, they weren't really helping us with th thinking about um, you know, how, how to live outside of the context of these institutions and these activities in which one gave papers and responded to papers and, and read good books and discussed good books. And I do think that that is a decisive difference. And I think Ian's way of working does, does tend to obviate that, that important distinction. It matters whether a philosopher takes themselves to be um, inculcating a way of life or whether they take themselves to be, uh, you know, a metaphysician who is discovering truths that have no existential implications at all, at least in the explicit formulation of those truths. I see John has a, a hand, but I just wanted to say thank you. Paper is really fascinating. I have a ton of thoughts uh, and just look forward to talking about it with you. Thanks, Eli. Thank you. I see that John Sellers also wants to intervene. Yes, thanks. Uh, thanks, Matt. That was um, that was really interesting. Um, and as you kind of prodded me, I thought I should say something. So you mentioned um, uh, that piece that I wrote a long time ago that you remember I read for you guys in Melbourne. And um, I, and in that, I mentioned three different ways that you that you <coughs> briefly that you might think about philosophy as way of life. And you said you were sympathetic to two and you were less sure about the third. And the third one, which I was just reporting a view by uh, uh, Tom Stern in a short piece, was the idea that any really good philosophy worth its name will 
offer some kind of um you know um uh, guidance or reflection on how to live it's just a mark of all good philosophy and some might do it more more explicitly than than, than others and so you mm. you said you were rejecting that and so i just really wanted to hear a bit more about why it is you thought that that wasn't a, a, a good way to think about this <sighs> um so this relates to the sort of the hunter position you know that I mean, the, the the phrase that I've quoted here, I hope I've quoted it correctly, is that PWL is one pole inherent to all philosophy. And that sounds like that comes from Tom Stern, yeah. sometimes marginalised but always present. But also you're saying that, yeah, in particular, good philosophy is always going to have that that dimension. Um, yeah, I guess, I, I guess I'm just pushing back against, um, you know, what if the philosopher doesn't explicitly flag that? You know, what if they, they don't think that that's what they're doing? What if they think they're writing, you know, they're Frege, they're writing on... on you know, on the foundations of logic or their Husserl, they're writing on transcendental intuition. I mean, you can make a stronger case, I think, that Husserl, because he's writing on intuition, is a little bit closer to anthropomorphizable than, <laughs> than someone like Frege. It just seems to me that, yeah, there is, there is space for philosophy, of course, that doesn't sort of do the PWL thing in an explicit, directed way. Um, and and that, that, that might serve different, you know, ends, including the ends of um, something like pure inquiry and, and curiosity. And I guess I'm just, um, I'm cautious about the extent to which we can take it that every philosophy that's kind of um, valuable or good um, has a, 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 you know, a really strongly at least PWL dimension. Um, I, I do think, and people can push back on this, that many of the students who come into philosophy programs, I think still think about philosophy that way and they still want to find such a dimension and one of the, the reasons why i think students so strongly identify with the theorists we teach them and they become deleuzeans or deridians or whatever it might be is in a sense they're looking for they're looking for that in the theorists that we teach them um whether it's always there um and and, and of course, I think that there simply are different degrees to which that pole is present. As I say, I think the Stoics are probably the purest case that I, I, I think um, you can make for, a, a, you know, a paradigmatically PWL and, and probably the Epicureans as well. Um, and then you might you might end up on the other end of the, the scale, as I say, with someone like Frege or you wouldn't even say Bertrand Russell because Bertrand Russell writes all sorts of different things, but Russell and his works on 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 technical questions. So I guess that that was my simple hesitation with that, that Tom Stern picture. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. I mean, if I just follow up briefly, I mean, I'm, I'm fairly, I mean, I, I'm not sure I've really made up my mind on this issue. I uh, at this point. Um, and so I'm, I, I'm also quite sympathetic to what you're saying. <laughs> and in the context of ancient philosophy in particular, and some of the, the, the criticisms that have been raised against Hadot's global claim about ancient philosophy I mean one mm. one uh, sort of potential set of potential counter examples that sometimes raises is some of the early pre-socratic um, natural philosophers right that you know who on the basis of the evidence that we have are just doing cosmology right um, it's not obvious as if as if the, there's a, a thought that there's some obvious practical application there and you know there's a later story in the context of say epicureanism where we get told a story about how well in fact it turns out doing cosmology can have all sorts of practical benefits for you um and that's an epicurean story right um wow. but whether any of those very early pre-socratic naturalists would have thought on those terms is another matter so yeah i mean it's quite telling that you know his book what is ancient philosophy kind of starts with socrates in the symposium and we don't hear that much about everything that that was going on before because it perhaps doesn't fit the narrative quite so neatly i'm aware of um a graduate student uh in australia in tasmania who's just completed a phd thesis on the pre-socratics as pwl people because i have had some affiliation with that university i'm not in the position to be an assessor of that thesis but I'm keen to to take a look because certainly when we were taught, when I was uh, in, uh, taught pre-Socratic philosophy, it was definitely taught that the physikoi were physikoi, and and they weren't interested, you know. Uh, but then then you can think about Parmenides's poem and the two ways, 
Um, I mean, there's the way of truth and the way of appearance, and they are ways. And I'd, I'd be interested to relook at the Greek terms and to understand exactly, you know, as I say, what the, the term for, for those paths or ways are. Um, but certainly we were taught that, you know, it was a metaphysical and physical set of competing doctrines, namely, of course, Heraclitus um, and Parmenides representing um, becoming and being more or less without then there's democritus though uh, you know who's who's a, a, an interesting case because we know that he wrote on euthymia and and seemed to have an ethics um which also seems as i understand it to have been related to his atomism so even before socrates you do have potential for um figures who who might present an interesting case um yeah, for sure. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll be quiet now. But yes, I mean, the even stronger example is, is surely going to be Pythagoras. Yes, well, that's right. Yeah. 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 Okay. Anyway, thanks. Cheers. <coughs> I see that Eli wants to intervene again. Oh, so, sorry, I'll try to be quick, but it just uh, your discussion made it come up. How are you thinking about the intentionality question to authenticity? And what I mean is I was... As you were discussing examples, there's, of course, I think philosophers who would say they are practicing philosophy as a way of life, but we could question about, you know, whether a, a deep transformation is happening. So this example may be too archaic, but like, for example, in India, I was thinking about the Nyaya uh, realist school. And they would say that their scholastical study of why, you know, there's a, a true substantive self is supposed to have soteriological value. It's supposed to transform your way of thinking about present perception, ease your concerns about, you know, the, the role of the self and what nirvana means. They, you know, they would argue that their scholastic education is and that they are doing some sorts of disciplinary practice to reach it. And another example I was thinking in your case is your point of the kind of tense dialogue with Domonsky about uh, whether, um, the disciplinary practice in the medieval university is too supposed to be a way of life. Because, you know, I, mm. I think Aquinas and many scholastics, at least in the earlier part, would say, yes, you get the life of contemplation, you see your place in the cosmos, your faith is reaffirmed. So I, I guess, you know, I, I see why you were trying to avoid that, the, you know, the hunter, I can see beneath your own understanding of philosophy. But on the other hand, then how do we deal with the intentionality problem? Or if you've, how have you thought about that? Is the intentionality problem the authenticity problem? I mean, it's yeah, yeah. Like, like so, like be... people who say, or, mm. I'll take another example. Many people in higher education well, institutions Seneca, say, Seneca issue. You know, people claim that Seneca would, yeah. As I was say, the Seneca issue. People claim that Seneca was terribly rich and and possibly, you know, a hypocrite. You know, and that that position comes up. Again, again, interestingly, Donald Robertson, who obviously works a lot on Marcus Aurelius in, in, in a kind of non-academic um, psychological context, doesn't like Seneca because he thinks that Seneca was a hypocrite. Um, so yeah, it, it, do you mean the authenticity question, the question of how can we assess whether someone is true to their... But even if a discipline, their, I guess this would be the challenge of a whole orientation of doing philosophy is hypocritical. That's where I was thinking like the medieval university or the Nyaya school or... Let's think of a middle ground in, in phenomenology, someone like Shaler, who does kind of get into this foggy area, right? He says phenomenology is an attitude, a kind of lived attitude that's supposed to be transformative. But he certainly buys all that Ian Hunter, you know, stuff you pointed to about getting underneath. So, yeah, I, just to add, yes, and also like on the bigger scale of particular schools that we might identify, you know, uh, who also, I guess, are vague, a little bit vague metaphilosophically. They're not like Frege, who say, no, we're not doing way of life work that's antithetical to philosophy, but we might be worried of, you know, on even Hadotian grounds that they're, they're not being completely honest about what their work is doing. Yeah, I mean, I think that one of the strengths of the Hadoshian, you know, way of understanding PWR is it does allow us to raise that question. I'm not sure whether you could raise that question in, in the context of Ian's work, you know. I mean, 
in a sense, there are different there are different personas who are uh, of philosophers who are producing different kinds of texts, and those texts embody, as far as Ian's concerned, as you heard, different kinds of exercises, forms of reasoning, forms of um, rhetoric, and so on. And he, he sort of he does the, the focus on the persona also will involve, I guess, forms of pedagogy, uh, ways of talking, and so on. Um, but you know. In, in many, many cases, um, and certainly in the cases of Schleber or, or, or Kant, you know, there really isn't a reflection on whether that persona, the academic persona, the professional persona that's being produced, relates to the wider way of living um, and, and might be measured against it and judged hi hypocritical. Um, so again, I think a strength of the Hadoshian program is you are able to sort of look at philosophers, compare what they say with what they did, um, and make an assessment as to as to the whether you want to call it authenticity or, or something else. Um, you, you mentioned some just a comment about the medieval practices of teaching and pedagogy as potential ways of life. Um, again, I think I think the disputation is a really interesting thing because it's related to the way the texts were produced. And Hutto actually has a piece on this. It's clearly indebted to the ancient philosophical ways of teaching. But again, you think the intentionality is really to teach a student how to debate in a certain more or less formalised context, using norms of um, adducing evidence. There are certain kinds of evidence you can adduce and certain kinds that are probably less less well regarded. So it's still quite a specific practice. It is a practice and I think in that sense the PWL approach enables you to recapture it and say this is a big part of what medieval philosophy was. It was producing students who could debate publicly um, philosophical questions and adduce points for and against. Um, you know, using certain kinds of evidence and so on, but it's still not a, you know, necessarily a wider way of life and that needs to be balanced against the fact that even within the university structure, philosophy was no longer autonomous. It was, it was in the Faculty of Arts, which was your preparation for specialisation in, in medicine, law or theology, um, which might not be a bad model um, um, in, 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 and there might be a better model than some of the others that we have today, but that was the model. And it certainly wasn't the model of the Platonic school where, of course, it was a philosophical school and you went there to do philosophy. <coughs> Thank you. That was great. I'll leave it now for others. I think I will take the opportunity to make uh, two comments, which I think are related to the discussion you were having, especially with uh, uh, John. Um, First, I'm, I'm not I'm, I'm not sure that uh, the Adotian model is so restricted as you implied in your paper. Uh, sure, PWL is is presented as a certain way of doing philosophy that contrasts with other ways of doing philosophy. Yeah. So certain philosophers with the model and others wouldn't. But as as um, as far as I can remember, or I don't remember any particular philosopher that Hado excludes from the PWL model. He contrasts the PW, PWL model essentially to the way it is practiced today, but the contrast seems to be more in terms of context, the way it is practiced, philosophy is practiced in modern universities and academies, rather than particular periods or uh, authors. And if I recall it correctly, in, in what is ancient philosophy, Hado says that an entire volume would be needed to tell the whole story of the reception of the ancient model of doing philosophy by medieval, modern, and contemporary philosophers. And he, he, he gives so many examples, right? Like Montaigne, Descartes, Kant, Rousseau, Schopenhauer, Emerson, Thoreau, Kierkegaard, Marx, Nietzsche, William James, Bergson, Wittgenstein, Merleau-Ponty, and then he even says, and still others. So of course, he doesn't uh, approach them thoroughly, he doesn't offer any his expertise was ancient philosophy, that was his field of study, and of course he doesn't give us any Doro account of any of these modern or contemporary philosophers, but he does leave us this invitation to interpret other modern and contemporary philosophers in, in, in the light of philosophy as a way of life, and then if you look at <coughs> contemporary scholarship on philosophy as a way of life every day, uh, and a new paper comes uh, uh, out showing that a certain philosopher is or belongs to the tradition of philosophy as a way of life. So it's very difficult to see uh, 
where exactly Hado draws the line, which philosopher would not be, would not have practiced philosophy as a way of life. And in strict connection with this, I would like to very boldly suggest <laughs> A third program to your uh, to your list yeah, yeah. because I feel <laughs> there's yeah, still yeah. something <laughs> missing. You know, I've also dealt with this topic. It's it's, it's a difficulty I, I I have when dealing with philosophy as a way of life, knowing exactly what we are talking about, right? And when we look at uh, contemporary scholarship, uh, we see that there is I, I would call it I don't know an experimental program which is probably the most normative of them all. In this program, you don't really claim anything particular about any particular philosopher, but you do have a normative claim on what philosophy is or should be. So you believe that philosophy, like uh, in this definition that, uh, that John uh, quoted, uh, that any philosophy worth that name must have an impact or must have some uh, include some guidance on how to live one's life or have some PWL connotation. So if we believe that, we might also believe that any possible philosophy offers you a certain way of seeing the world and hence has the at least the potentiality or the capacity to change your way of life. And so the experiment would be, and I think this is implied even in our project, actually, when we want to to publish this handbook on the art of living, or also in the um, in the Notre Dame uh, grant that develops the pedagogical programs, yeah, new teaching programs on the basis of PWL. What is at stake is really a rereading of the history of Western philosophy from the prism of philosophy as a way of life, uh, and 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 so in this experimental program, I would call it like that. Sorry to appropriate myself of your list of your um, uh, programs, but I would add this, this experimental one where you just try to see how the history of philosophy would look like if seen from the perspective of doctrine, systems, and so on, but from the perspective of the worldviews, ways of life, uh, the arts of living, the practices, the attitudes. <laughs> I would just like to see what you would think sure, of this sure, idea sure 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 <laughs> i mean it sounds to me like it broadly uh it sounds closer to me to the rest restricted in one way than the expanded well of course this term program I, I, I wrote the paper initially about two years ago and I, I, I don't like that term. I, I needed a better term because it really does make it sound more systematic than I think it perhaps is. Um, but so I can, yeah, I'm happy to, as it were, take that, that on, on notice and, and, and have further conversations with you about that. I mean, there's always a sense in which one can read a text and this this raises another set of questions, I think. You know, I, I gave a paper once on a gum that was quite critical. Well, I'm not a huge fan. And the student said, yeah, but when I read a garment, um, and I, I'm given that a garment can be read as a garment from the perspective of an existential interest, which I not wasn't convinced is, is the, in the original. Um, so, I mean, that, that's a third possibility, as you say, of just of kind of reading, reading these texts from the perspective of what what can be gleaned from them in some way from the perspective of an existential concern with how to live um, and you know I think I think that, that that's a really interesting interesting possibility that might also bring with it you know problems um, as well like any program does you know potential for for misappropriations but um, you know I think that's another thing worth talking about it's a super point about um, uh, uh, um, whether what Hutto is kind of presenting PWL as opposed to is is more really the, the practices and contexts of what we're doing as academics than particular philosophers. Thank you for making that point. I um I, I confess I think I was writing the two together. Um I mean it's it's that distinction between, you know, Kant talks about I think architects of reason, and then there's the other type of um philosopher that he that Hado talks about in the context of Kant, who is on the ancient model. Um and I guess um I guess, you know, I, I, I take it that architects of reason are philosophers who just kind of, you know, write books and are interested in ideas more or less purely and then they kind of clock off at 5 p.m. and then they go home and and sort of, you know, just sort of, I don't know, just 
live in such a way that their professional work has as little to do with their their wider way of life as that of say a lawyer who practices law and works until 5 p.m if they're lucky from what i understand lawyers and then goes home to their husband wife or kids or whatever their family context is and just lives a life that could be christian islamic or anything else and or atheistic but has nothing to do with their professional work um but I, i'm going to need to now re look at <laughs> what is ancient philosophy and 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 see uh, is there a philosopher who is as you say actually kind of named as not um not philosophy as a way of life and i think from a first recollection you may be right that i don't doesn't say and here is an example of a philosopher who we can clearly say i mean you might be hard put to make frager a, a philosophy as a way of life person i, I would have thought um but you know people can disagree i know eli's done work on on uh, that that might relate to this question <coughs> but thank you for troubling me <laughs> thank you Matthew. and john maybe has a, an idea of a philosopher who does not belong to philosophy as a way of life well i'm not sure i do but the, the context, is, I mean, the kind of, the polemical context is against contemporary academics, isn't it, right? It, and that, that, that passage from Thoreau, right, you know, it's all just professors these days, not real philosophers. And, you know, it, and even since the rise of the academy, there have been this handful of outsiders. They were the serious philosophers. And you can think about people like Nietzsche in the 19th century, or you might think about the existentialists in the in the 20th century. It's the outsiders who are the who are the serious philosophers, and they're treating it as a guide to life. And you could imagine, you know, that story extending all the way, you know, you know, all the way back. Um, but of course, the issue becomes really acute in the 20th century. So it may well be that, that the vast majority of the history of philosophy up to the 19th century can be um, sort of, I don't want to say reinterpreted as philosophy as a way of life, but properly understood as philosophy as a way of life, because that's what it always was. It's just that to come back to your central theme of historiography, that our historiography is shaped by, you know, who we are or you know, not us in this room, but who modern academics are and imposing that conception of philosophy as a, as a theoretical discipline back onto um, previous generations. Just a, a quick thought too for, for that project, Marta and Matt, I think we would have to be careful of genteel approaches to criticism versus who is or is not included. So what I mean is there's, I, I suspect Hado is of a group uh, that I, I think was more common a generation ago that did not like to name people individually who are there providing criticism and tend to prefer these broad structures. So it'd be interesting to try to dig around to see if we could really point out un enough common patterns. You know, he certainly says of his disappointment with existentialism. You know, he, he hints in more biographical interviews. Um, and, and then my only other thought too is also a, a difference in speaking of his own aims with the books, how do we unpack Hado's own aim of inviting people in in those books, often for a broad audience in his later, later uh, writing versus conceptual definitiveness that might exclude, you know, bringing in people to a kind of trans transformational reapproachment with philosophy as a way of life. So, anyways, no answers, but just to make the question even more complicated, like what would it even mean as, as John is saying to, you know, to, to unpack those definitions within the kind of context of both where we're at and also how Hado was thinking about bringing, making people reflect on our own context. Thank you to both John and Eli for those, those comments. I'm, I'm really interested, Eli, to discuss more your comment about uh, different uh, approaches to, to criticism and this issue of, um, you know, who, who might be, I guess, included, welcomed, um, uh, taken seriously and so on. I think that's um, very interesting. Um, I mean, one thing I will say, um, you know, just as John was speaking, and, and I, I really um, condone uh, everything that he said, but I mean, 
I guess one, 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 one risk with PWL approaches is you can wholly re go to relativize the rational dimensions of text. And I guess that's part of what I'm saying about Ian Hunter. But for example, I, I spent quite a bit of time trying to get to the bottom of the Straussian reading of, the, of Plato in the, in the 2000s, you know, and, and, you know, for my sins, because I, in the end I became completely disillusioned. But anyway, their, their bet noir is the analytic approaches, people like Vlastos and so on. And, and, you know, in that school, you're sort of taught that that approach is wholly bunk because of it excludes literary considerations. But, you know, I really do nevertheless think that there are components of the platonic dialogues that an, a modern analytic approach can, can be really quite helpful with. You know, the, the analytics at least take the parts of the dialogue that they don't exclude and they find serious philosophy. They take them very seriously. Um, and, you know, I think Vlastos, um, I think Vlastos is, is pretty good on Socrates, for example, better than Leo Strauss um, in, in a lot of ways. Um, so, yeah, I guess I just want to, I just want to throw that in there. Um, it's just that the analytic approach, then you, then you are, then, you know, what's, you know, two thirds of, well, one third of the, of the Theotetus, for example, is, is really amenable to that analytic approach. And then there's all this other stuff. And then as an analytic, you say, well, that's fine. We just cut that out of the textbook and just include the, you know, the four pages where there's this, you know, kind of, in their view, rigorous argumentation. Um, and clearly that there's something inappropriate about that. You know, I don't think Plato would have liked that. I mean, he wouldn't have written the whole thing if he didn't want the whole thing to be considered as a philosophical document, I believe. <coughs> And I wonder about just on that, the, the, the role of textbooks in all of this and the role of sampling, because then you, students come through and they just get those four pages of Theotetus and that's their Plato. And that shapes how they think about Plato. And I know that Christopher Colenza and others in, who, who do intellectual history on the early modern period are very interested in who wrote the textbooks and what was included in the textbooks. And I think that's a really interesting because of the role that textbooks play in all of our formation, um, I, I really think that's quite quite important. You know, um, the anthologies. You know, what's a continental philosopher? Well, here's my anthology. You know, what's what's an analytic philosopher? Here's my anthology. Um, anyway. <coughs> okay. Thank you. If there are no further questions, I will now close this session. Thank you all for being there and special thanks to, to Matthew and all the ones who contributed for the discussion. The next session of the seminar will be on the 12th of April and please note that it will be at a different time. Due to the clock changes soon, the seminar will be held at 12 uh, o'clock UTC from April to June. I hope that won't be a problem to any of you, even though it will be pretty early, especially in the United States. Uh, our speaker in the next session will be John Sellers, who will present uh, a paper on Aristotle and philosophy as a way of life. If you have already subscribed to our mailing list, you will not you will automatically receive a reminder in the link, a link so you don't need to, to do it again. So once again, thank you so much for being there and hope to see you again next time. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Marta. Thank you. See you.